Okay. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. We'll see. I, I, I don't really care so much about chapter 12. I really don't. That's terrible of me to say. We should have we should have Madison on Zoom. Where I wonder if where she is. She's joined our meeting. <laughs> it says she joined the meeting, but I don't see her. Madison. Did I join the right? Did I join the right meeting? Uh, How can you tell? Um, you can't tell. Or wherever the information about the meeting is. There's not there. Info, down at the bottom. Oh. Yeah, so, and she joined. It doesn't show that there's anybody. Usually it'll tell me. It'll automatically pop up a waiting room. And I don't see, I don't see anybody on, but it says she's there. Well, she'll get a recording if it doesn't come through. No, because she'll watch the video. It'll be okay. All right. But I don't understand why she can't. But okay. So, uh, papers going around. A uh, papers going around for y'all to sign up for your groups. So once everybody has signed it, if if you're if you're in a group and nobody in your group has signed yet, just put it in a group. It doesn't matter. Just make sure everybody's together, right? So you should know by now who your group members are, right? Everybody good on that? Okay, and you have your the ones that you want? An idea? Okay, so once everybody signs, then we'll do the, we'll do the, the picking. Um, I posted a bunch of different things. I posted for people who don't have the, who have the first edition to update them to the second edition, right? Everybody, I emailed you personally if you have that issue. Anybody not get an email from me who needs one? Okay. Um, I posted all the case studies. Y'all were able to find the case studies? Yes. At first, y'all tell me, the first time I put it, the link um, only went to one of the case studies, not to the folder. Oh, there she is. There she is, admit. See, I told you it would pop up. Okay. Welcome, Madison. We were worried we didn't see you. Okay. So, um, <coughs> case studies and Madison, whose group are you in? You just type in the chat and tell me who's, whose group you're in eventually. Um, what else? What else was I supposed to do for y'all? I don't remember. Did I, did I do what's up? They should be open. The homework and the reading quiz should be open should already be open and people are saying yes. Okay, so that's good. Um, what else? And I put a Zoom link to the class meetings. So the recordings y'all asked for, this will be the link right here. It's under the Zoom link. It will be a recording of every single class. Okay, because I because I love y'all. Do that for y'all. Oh, that, that was, y'all wanted the link to, Biochem one stuff, right? Mm -hmm. That was the other thing I wanted. So I need to add that link to Biochem one, and I'll put it right under there. I'll put it right under that link. Okay, anything else I am missing? Yeah. Okay, can you go to the student chart? Oh, yeah, because I locked it because it should be the same, but I will unlock it. At, thank you. So everybody signed up. Two, three, four. We only have, we have one group with only two people in it. Or Mad Madison, what group are you in? Or name a group member. Uh, uh, wait, I gotta think about my passwords. 
Oh, good Lord. This second verification thing and we can't change it drives me bananas. Yes, it's me. I know. I know. It's better safe than sorry. Yeah, and my phone like sometimes works and sometimes doesn't work and I don't understand why that is. Okay, so I need to. Um, already has a sheet protection. Okay, so I just want to trash it. Okay, so now you should be able to edit it. If you changed your seat, you should be able to edit it now. But what I want you to do is sit in the same seat. That it is right. I did. I did change it around because y'all were like, "That was really weird." Okay, Brooke. Let's see. Okay, so you're yes. I got you and Brooke's group. Okay. All right. Good. Okay, y'all ready to pick your pick your uh. So I just, what I did is I'm, I'm going to do a random number generator. We have four groups. So whatever number comes up, they're going to have first pick. Okay. okay. What group are you in? Uh, you run them on there? Oh, oh, okay. Yes, you're on there. All right. Y'all ready? Here we go. Group three, which is Taylor, Victoria, Taylor, and Chloe. What is your first pick? So case study three. Okay. Come on. Group two. So Matthew, Emily, Francis, Austin. What is your pick? Study two. All right. Generate. Case group one. What is your pick? Okay, study four. Okay, so Tyler, Allen, Brooke, and Madison, y'all are case study number one. Good. Everybody know what they are? All right. Okay. And is anybody not able to see themselves checked in on iClicker? So I think Madison, you need to. Okay, Madison, you're good. Okay. Um, yes. Refresh it. Refresh it. Like close it and open it again. Anybody able to edit it? It says last edit two minutes ago. No, you can't edit it? Mine doesn't even have like a second. Ah. Editor. Not only is mine, yeah. mine doesn't okay, try it now. You didn't, you didn't, yeah, put, you didn't now. put in the new uh, A new thing. A new no, we're not going to. We're not going to do that anymore. We're going to do one seating chart, and you have to stay in these seats for the rest of the semester. Oh, oh well, then I don't need to change right So you, if you are no, sitting, it should be good. It's still Just refresh it. So you should be sitting in the same seats from now until the end of the semester. Y'all good with that? Okay. So once y'all are done, I'd like to lock it and then we don't edit it. We leave it as it is. Yes. Well, because I thought I would have half and half of, of edition one and edition two, but I might update to edition two now that I know that everybody can get the second edition. So yeah, I might do that. They're pretty much the same. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to, now that I know that we're all working with the same edition, I'm going to transition over to the new edition. So I'll update it and I'll probably post that over the weekend. Okay. So, but this, this chapter, especially we did in the second edition with, with some, you know, so, you know, yes. Yes. All the 
That's fine. And I posted, I posted a PDF of chapter one, chapter one, chapter 11. So if you go here to supplemental material, yeah, if you go here to chapter 11 supplemental material, was it supplemental? No, where did I post it? The reading. I posted the supplemental doesn't have it. I know I did it for y'all. Yeah, I don't want to email you again. No, you should always email me again. You can send me 10 emails a day. I don't care. Did I put it just in the announcements? I know I did it. Uh, in the supplementary materials link. That's what I said I did, but I didn't. Okay, I will, I will, I know I made it. I maybe just didn't, that's discussion questions. Yeah. Okay, so I need the PDF of chapter 11 y'all email me right away when i say i did something and i didn't like tell me okay so i will get that fixed what else good and then in the meantime i'm with the talking to the publisher about getting everything fixed austin did you do the trial no not yet I'm... can you do it before you walk out the door today so that i can have everybody yeah together yeah, I can... So before you walk out the door today, okay? And if you need help with it, okay, if you want to help, if you want me to help you at the end of class, I'll help yeah. you. Okay. So it looks like you can do the homework. Oh, that's good. Okay. So, so I'll have the reading material up like five minutes after class is over and you could do the homework. Okay. So now we can finally get started, right? All right. Y'all, okay, so I'm gonna put Madison's chat down here and I can get rid of this. All right, now we're ready. Anything else? Okay, all right. So what we talked about last time, right, was that there are things that are gonna have to leave and enter the mitochondrial matrix, right? So why can't they just pass through an open channel in the membrane? Why is that not gonna happen? Like, what are you trying to pass through the membrane? Let's, let's, let's talk a little bit before we do the slide. So what, what do we need to move? We talked about this yesterday. So the electron carriers, E carrier and ABH. Okay, what else? And then ATP. Now, when we talk about ATP, we just write it as this right atp adenosine triphosphate does it carry a charge yes it does and we know what that charge is it is negative four okay so atp has to go where in or out of the mitochondrial matrix of matrix we made it we need it to go out what else has to go out or in doesn't matter adp which is a charge of negative three because we have lost the phosphate. the phosphate group, which is another thing that needs to go in. So what do you think the charge on an inorganic phosphate is? Plus one. Oh, plus minus one. Minus one. Minus one. Because an inorganic phosphate is really H2PO4 minus. That's what inorganic phosphate is, right? We just shorthand it, right? But that's the phosphate group that gets tacked onto ADP. So why can't we have these, these, especially inorganic phosphate, that's pretty small. Why can't that just go through a channel in the membrane? No. What's the whole point of the electron transport chain? You gotta create the gradient. So, right, we're, we're pumping hydrogen ions here, right? So what would happen if we have a, a channel that would allow ions to just slip through back into the matrix. Yeah. You defeated the entire purpose of the electron transport chain, right? So you can't have channels that allow non-specific charged things to pass through the membrane. Otherwise, this doesn't work, right? So what we have to have are some kind of transport systems, transport, active transport systems that will move these charged things around, right? 
that's that's the main thing that you have to get from from this and they're going to be shuttles or trans low cases so there are two different classes that that are going to be involved in these processes in the matrix so shuttles or trans low cases so there are two shuttles these two shuttles, the malate aspartate shuttle and the glycerol 3 phosphate shuttle, these are shuttles for what? For NADH, right? And then we also need to be able to translocate our ATP, ADP, and inorganic phosphate, right? So our shuttle systems are for the electron carriers. And then we have uh, two different translocases that help with import and export of ADP, PI, and ATP. So the ATP has to go out, right? We're going to make a ton of it. But however much ATP you make, you need exactly that same amount of ADP, right? So for every one you use, you want to put a new one in. So we have a perfect system with this ATP, ADP translocase. Because for every one ATP that goes out, we have an ADP that goes in. But there's something important to remember in this translocase. What did y'all tell me the charge on ATP is? Minus four. What is it on ADP? Negative three. Is this a neutral transport system? No, it's not. But you're going to see that it works out pretty well, actually but it is not a neutral transport system. Then you have a phosphate translocase. A phosphate translocase translocates one inorganic phosphate, which is a charge of negative one, and one hydrogen ion, which is a charge of plus one into the matrix. So this one is electrically neutral, right? Okay, so let's look at them individually. So the ATP, ADP translocase is, we call this a rocking banana system, a rocking banana. So with this kind of a translocase, basically you have two different conformations of the translocase. So if you look at the very end, this is the C state. The C state tells me that this translocase is open to it's not really the cytosolic side, it's really the intermembrane space, but they call it C for cytosolic because it's more open to the cytosol. So in the C state, you can have ADP bound to it, right? Now, as soon as ADP binds, that induces a conformational change in the translocase. Changes to the M state. The M state allows the ADP to be released and has high affinity for ATP. So our ATP binds. When that binds to the M state, it induces a conformational change and it reverts back to the C state, right? So you get basically this kind of a system happening, right? And you trade ADP and um, ATP. So how do we know that you actually have these two different conformations? Because different inhibitors will inhibit different states. So if you inhibit with one particular inhibitor, and it doesn't really matter what it is, you don't have to memorize that. Don't, don't worry about memorizing inhibitor names. You can inhibit the conformation changing from C state to M state. So it basically locks it in the C state. You can inhibit with a different inhibitor and it will only associate with the M state and will prevent M going to C. So we know that there are two different conformations because we can use two different specific inhibitors to inhibit the two different states. So a lot of times that's how, that's how things are, are determined in science, in our experiments. So, all right, so this one, if, if I'm going to classify it, what kind of a transport system is this? If one thing is going in at the same time as something else going out, that's an antiporter. That's an antiporter. Okay. So even though it's a translocase and not a channel, we still call it an antiporter. 
So our phosphate translocase is a lot closer to the conformation of a channel. And this can actually act either as a symporter or as an antiporter. So what we talked about so far, right, is that we have this inorganic phosphate. This is PI. And this inorganic phosphate, as it comes in, is also going to pull in a hydrogen ion. So electrically, if you pull a negative and you pull a positive in, what's your overall net charge? Did you change the charge? No. So this is why this one's electrically neutral. So it can behave this way, but it can also behave where we have one inorganic phosphate coming in at the same time as a hydroxide ion going out. So if I import a negative and I export a negative, I'm still, guess what? Electrically neutral, right? So do you remember um, when we were doing way back when, when we were counting up how many hydrogen ions it takes to make an ATP molecule? Do you remember that? Do you remember how many it was? It was, it was like three or four, right? And we said, we said, we're not really sure why it takes four hydrogen ions if one turn of the crank of the ATP synthase only requires three hydrogen ions to go through it, right? Remember that? Well, where's the fourth one coming from? So this is three to drive ATP synthase plus what? plus one required to pump an inorganic phosphate in. So plus one to pump in PI. So that's why we say, you know, we said it was like three, but really when you do the math, it ends up being four. And this is why. Okay. All right. So now that we know how those things get in, now what do we have to talk about? Our shuttle systems for our electron carriers, right? Oh, 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 this is, oh, yeah, this is what I was trying to say, right? It required three hydrogen ions to go through and crank this motor, right? But then you also needed one of them in order to pull in your inorganic phosphate that's going to go to be used to make the ATP. So that was that. All right, so malate aspartate shuttle. So when we talk about the malate aspartate shuttle, which, which organ are we in? We're in the liver, right? Okay, so the malate aspartate shuttle is very, how do we say this, um, is very equivalent, right? However much you make of NADH inside of the cytosol, you're going to make inside of the mitochondria. So it takes a little bit longer because there are many more steps in the malate aspartate shuttle instead of the, versus the glycerol 3 phosphate shuttle, but it's highly conserved, right? So the whole point is if we're going to do glycolysis, right, we're going to make NADH. But if I want glycolysis to continue, what do I need in the cytosol? I need NAD plus. So it's not so much that NAD can be used to make ATP. It can be, right, because it's an electron carrier. But if we never recycle NADH to NAD plus, glycolysis will stop. And then you got big problems, right? So you have to have a way to get rid of the NADH in the cytosol. And if you're going to do that, you might as well harness those electrons and use them in the electron transport chain, right? So we take those electrons and oxaloacetate is actually going to pick up those electrons and it's going to be converted into malate. So this is the malate aspartate shuttle. So when you're naming the shuttle, the two things that are in the shuttle's name are the two things that can actually be transported between the cytosol and the mitochondria. So we convert to malate. Now malate is transported into the mitochondria using um, a, a transporter that as one malate goes in, we're going to transport an alpha keto glutarate out, right? So what kind of a transporter? 
One in, one out, Annie Porter, okay? And that's gonna be really important in just a little bit that we have alpha ketoglutarate in the uh, cytosol. Well, not the cytosol, but in the inner membrane space, which will eventually go to the cytosol because it's permeable, okay? So we have malate. Now, that malate can get converted back to oxaloacetate if it gives its electrons to an NAD plus molecule, right? So the reaction that happened in the forward direction here happens in the reverse here, right? So all these reactions are reversible, but oxaloacetate can't be transported anywhere, right? It's stuck. So what we end up doing is through an amino transferase, converting it to aspartate. In that transition, it requires glutamate and a byproduct is alpha ketoglutarate. We don't want alpha ketoglutarate building up, so what do we do? We transport it out, right? This is like, this is like an insanely perfect system. I really love this transporter. So we convert to aspartate. Now we have a transporter that can ship aspartate out at the same time as bringing glutamate in. So we have another antiporter, right? So now that we have aspartate, we can convert aspartate to acetate if we have alpha ketoglutarate. Well, what did we bring in? Alpha ketoglutarate, right? So do you see how this perfect system, and we're gonna make our byproduct of glutamate that actually got shipped in here. So it's a really perfect system in terms of conservation of number of NADH in the cytosol to number of NADH entering the electron transport system. So it's a really beautiful system. Huh. Now, if it's NADH, we just say electron transport system here, but where in the electron transport system are we actually going to drop off these electrons from NADH? I'm gonna go straight to complex. One, which means it's going to go through what? The entire electron transport system. Or chain, whatever. I always say ETC, right? Okay, so if we look at our opposing shuttle, this is the glycerol 3 phosphate shuttle, and this is going to be where? Muscle. And you got to think about what does muscle need? Muscle a lot of times needs energy really quickly. It's not about how much you have, it's about how quick you need it. Because muscles will, you're usually not gonna run at a really high speed for a really long time, right? You're gonna sprint and you need a high amount of ATP all at once. So the more of those um, electrons that we can get in quickly, the better. It's not about conserving the number, it's about getting them in quickly. So these are gonna deliver, this shuttle is gonna deliver electrons from NADH to not NAD plus, but now FAD, right? So the FAD is gonna pick them up, convert it to what? FADH2, FADH2 is going to drop them off to complex one? So it's gonna go through complex two, which doesn't pump anything which then transfers those electrons to you, right? So we're actually missing complex one. So we're not gonna pump those hydrogen ions that complex one usually does. So we're gonna get fewer ATP from this transport system, okay? All right, so let's look at how this one works, right? So we have glycolysis, we made NADH, right? It's the same sort of thing. We still need glycolysis to go. We still need to generate NAD plus. So what happens is we have dihydroxyacetone phosphate that undergoes a dehydrogenase reaction and we make glycerol 3 phosphate. So remember, that's what the, the system is named after, whatever can go through the membrane. So glycerol 3 phosphate goes through the, the membrane. We have the exact same enzyme, except it's mitochondrial, that catalyzes the reverse reaction. So now we've made dihydroxyacetone phosphate ship it out and go again. So you see there's fewer steps, it happens more quickly so that muscle can get what it needs very, very quickly. But we're not entering electron transport chain at complex one. We're entering kind of halfway through. 
right? So when we look at the, the numbers, right, we know that we're getting different numbers right here in liver cells and muscle cells, right? So, so if you're in the glycerol three phosphate shuttle, you're only making one and a half ATP per NADH molecule. But we, we don't count, when we're counting how many ATP we make, we don't really count it in fractions of ATP, right? So how do we make that a whole number? Just multiply by two, you get three ATP per two NADH, right? So that's the glycerol 3 phosphate. So how about the malate aspartate shuttle? Yep, you get 2.5 ATP per NADH. Multiply that by two, you get five ATP per NADH. Per two, thank you. ATP per two NADH. So now do you see where that difference is right here? Now it makes sense, right? At the end of last semester, you're like, I don't get it. <laughs> but that's okay. So now we understand why, why it's different. Pretty cool, right? Okay. Questions on that? Good. All right. So we have a last section, and then we're going to go back to doing discussion stuff. Yeah, because we're only 9.30. We're doing good. Okay. All right. So we didn't talk about every time we talk about a pathway, we're going to talk about how it's regulated. We did that with glycolysis. We did that with citrate. So now we're doing it with oxidative phosphorylation. And that's going to be a common theme throughout the entire uh, semester. So we've got to remember the basics of regulation. What, is, what are some of the most common ways that pathways are regulated in the cell? Mm -hmm. Feedback inhibition is great. Energy and energy currency, right? Those are our big, our big control mechanisms. So ATP and ADP are gonna control aerobic respiration. And aerobic respiration depends on what three things. We have to go through first what? Glycolysis, then citrates. Yeah, yeah, pyruvate dehydrogenase. But we just say glycolysis to citrate, CTR, citrate, to oxidative phosphorylation, right? So it's going to control all three. And then we know from studying the citrate cycle that NADH and NAD plus ratios control citrate, right? Remember that. So that's nothing really new. So if you look, this is, I think this is really a cool, a very cool little diagram, right? Because we have glycolysis, we have citrate cycle, and then all the way at the bottom, you have electron transport. So if you look at all of these different places, what we're labeling on this diagram are anything that is energy currency or um, inter electron carrier. Those are the two inhibitors and promoters of the different uh, steps in the pathway. So those are the only two things we're really looking because there are other ways that these things are regulated, right? Now remember that. And a lot of times that's like feedback inhibition within citrate, within glycolysis, right? So if you look, you have inhibitors and promoters within glycolysis, ATP, AMP, and organic phosphate, right? We also have inhi inhibition and promotion with uh, NADH and NAD+. So that's all glycolysis. Now we get to citrate. Same thing, ATP is going to inhibit, right? Because if you have a high energy charge in the cell, do you need to make more ATP? No, but if your cells are using ATP fast, what happens? ATP tanks, what goes up? ADP. A little bit of AMP too. So sometimes you'll see that, um, like right here, AMP. So high levels of AMP or ADP are going to promote these pathways. And then high levels of ATP or NADH, <clears throat> excuse me, are going to inhibit them. So when you look down here, if we look specifically at the electron transport chain, 
you see that it's ADP and it's PI, right? So one thing to kind of note is the electron transport chain is not very detailed there now, is it? It's kind of all boxed in together. So when you think about this um, positive allosteric regulation of electron transport chain, it's really two things. You're, you're, you are increasing your rate of ATP synthesis, right? ATP synthase. That could try to extend the page. ATP synthase, right? It's going to regulate it. The more ADP and PI you have, the faster that ATP synthase can run. But at the same time, you're also increasing the rate of electron flow through the ETC. So it's really twofold within the electron transport system, right? It's just not, it's not, they didn't blow it up enough. Okay. So that's, so that's kind of generally how we're regulated. But there are some kind of special um, organisms, for example, bears, right, that undergo hibernation. Yeah, they have to store, they have to eat a lot, so they build up a lot of fat so that they have energy for the winter. But you got to think about why do they wake up? But, but physically, chemically, why do they wake up? Do they have like increased levels of like ADP? So it's actually all about heat. Do you remember the uncouplers that we talked about last, last semester, right? If you have the electron transport chain that's running and you don't want to make ATP, you can stick a, a, a um, uh, an uncoupler, thank you, I just said it, why I couldn't remember it. An uncoupler, those protons are gonna flow and what you're gonna do is you're gonna generate heat. So that's exactly what happens. So, so this is kind of, this is a different, this is a different experiment. So I'm gonna kind of explain this experiment, but I, I want you to understand why it's important about um, uncoupling. So this is chemical uncoupling. So this is basically a Petri dish, right? And so we have this Petri dish and inside this Petri dish, we have a buffer with oxygen in it, right? We have inside of this buff buffer, we also have ADP and inorganic phosphate, right? Because we wanna know what's going to happen. Is the, is the uh, oxidative phosphorylation going to actually occur, right? And at the same time, we also need something to give electrons to the electron transport system to make it run. So what we end up giving is succinate. So succinate is basically our electron carrier, right? And it can enter the system. So at time zero, <clears throat> excuse me, we don't have any ADP, we don't have any PI, we don't have any succinate, and it's pretty much flat. But here early on, we add succinate, we add ADP, we add PI. What happens to oxygen consumption? It goes up. And I'm telling you, if you don't do anything else, oxygen consumption, I was trying to do that in blue, will just keep going up until you run out of substrate, right? If you don't do anything else, it will just keep going up. How about ATP synthesis? Look at ATP synthesis, that's the red line. After I add ADP and PI, what happens? ATP synthesis <laughs> keeps going, right? Okay, so now we're gonna add some inhibitors. Cyanide is an example of an inhibitor. Cyanide will prevent um, those hydrogen ions from going through the circuit. So it will actually inhibit the electron transport chain itself. So you're gonna block the last complex, cyanide blocks, hold on, blocks complex four, right? If you block any of the complexes, all the previous complexes get backed up and nothing happens, right? So what do we see when we add cyanide? 
We're going to stop O2 consumption. We're going to stop ATP synthesis. Both things flatline, right? What if I add an uncoupler? So that's what 2,4-dinitrophenol is, uncoupler. Is that going to rescue the phenotype? No, because you're still inhibiting the entire electron tra transport chain. So nothing's going to happen. It's still going to inhibit it. Now, in B, if you look at oligomyosin, um, oligomyosin is going to be different. Oligomyosin um, will actually prevent, let me try to say this. Um, it's not going to inhibit your electron transport chain. It's going to inhibit your ATP synthase. So this stops ATP synthase, right? So if we stop, stop ATP synthase, everything else is going to get backed up, right? But what happens if we stop ATP synthase and we add that same uncoupler? Now the electron transport chain can run and we're going to consume O2. We can see that spike. But what's going to happen with ATP synthase? We're still inhibiting it, so it's still not going to work, right? So this is this is basically um, there was a there was a fad uh, I don't remember how many years ago, uh, quite a long time ago, where we're like, okay, if we can create this diet drug, right, that will make the body think that it can't make ATP through the electron transport chain, the body's just going to use fatty acids to make energy, right? Well, the problem was that the drug that they designed basically is a suicide inhibitor and sticks to it. And so the cell cells wouldn't never recover. And so it was causing big, big damage to people's bodies and things. And so it was like this really big, oh my gosh, you're gonna lose so much weight and then you die. You know, so right, exactly, exactly. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. So why is uncoupling a beneficial thing? Well, uncoupling is a beneficial thing because if you stop making ATP and you let those hydrogen ions go through a natural uncoupler, so UCP1 is an example of a uh, uncoupler that is made in organisms that hibernate. So when hibernation time is over, UPC1 is actually upregulated and it allows these hydrogen ions to flow through and it generates heat. So this is kind of a non-shivering way, non-shiver way to generate heat. So the, the expression level of this uncoupler is dependent upon the environment the organism is in and it's only in certain cell types, right? So y'all know there are different kinds of fat tissues, right? There's different kinds of adipose. There's brown adipose and white adipose tissues. So the brown adipose, if you look at them, do you see every single teeny tiny little circle? Those are all lipid droplets. So in brown adipose tissue, each cell, this is one cell right there, has tons and tons and tons of small fat droplets, leaves you a bunch of room for mitochondria, right? Which are what are gonna generate the heat. White adipose tissue, on the other hand, typically has one single fat droplet and it is huge. So this is one cell. Is there much room for anything else? No, so you don't have a whole lot of mitochondria. So organisms that have brown adipose tissue tend to be ones that hibernate. Now, when we're born, we're born with about 5% of this brown adipose tissue, but that's the baby fat that you lose as you get older, right? So it's another way that babies can thermally regulate their body temperature. Pretty cool, right? Okay, this I find super, super interesting. But I, I'm sorry, I don't think you're gonna find it well, that's not true. I was going to say, I don't think you can find a topic in this textbook that I'm not really excited about. 
but that's the ball, so, so to speak. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So y'all know that inside of your cells, DNA is in the nucleus, right? DNA is also in the mitochondria. So, and the reason we that works is because it's the what's that? Exactly. The endosymbiosis theory tells us that what we think is that cells engulfed another living cell, right? And then it was more beneficial for that engulfed cell to stay inside of that other living cell. And then it basically got incorporated into the organism. So if you look, most of the proteins that are made in the mitochondria are encoded for by mitochondrial DNA, not all. There are some exceptions, but most of them are encoded for in the mitochondrial DNA. So what are the most important things that function inside of the mitochondria? Electron transport chain, right? Um, so if you have a mutation in any of the genes that encode for the components of the electron transport chain, you're gonna have a lower amount of ATP produced for a typical amount of NADH or for whatever you're eating in that kind of cells, right? Um, so where do you see physiological phenotypes? A lot of times in neuronal cells and skeletal muscle cells, cells that require a lot of energy, right? These are high energy, high energy cells. So what do you know about mitochondria? My, they are the powerhouse. Now we know why they are the powerhouse of the cell. Who do you get them from? Only your mom, right? Only your mom. Because the mitochondria inside of sperm are only in the tail, which gets detached and does not become part of the embryo. So you're slightly, this is another reason why you're slightly more your mother than your father, right? So I, I played that for y'all. Did I not? I'm going to, okay. So at the end of class, if there's time, I'm going to play a little video for y'all because it's hilarious and awesome. Um, so you only get it from your mother, which means the inheritance pattern and how you express those mutations are going to be very different in mitochondrial um, genetic defects. So when you get your mitochondria from your mom, right, you have a maternal line when you're looking at genetics, right? Have you looked at those? If you've, taken, you've taken genetics, right? You've looked at the pedigrees where you can track mutations, right? And so they'll track differently if it's a um, mitochondrial disease versus a nuclear disease, right? Because you're only going to get it from your mother, right? And now if you're a male, right? You're only going to express, so let me, let me put it this way. I said you can have mutations in your mitochondria, right? From that's only from mother, but you also have genes that regulate and run your mitochondrial functions that are nuclear. So if you inherit that kind of a gene mutation, you're going to have a difference depending on if you're male or female, right? Because it's the X chromosome, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. So if you have mutations where you have a female who gets two X chromosomes, right? But only one of the X chromosomes has the mutation, the other one's normal. Does that mean that that female is going to express the disorder? Depends, it depends. Because if you're female, only one of your X chromosomes is expressed in any given cell at any given time. Basically, your cell says, let's pick one randomly, shut this one down and let this one run. So you can have different cell types that have different expression patterns because of the mutation, right? So you can have this insanely variable symptoms and phenotypes with this. So lots of times people come into the ER with symptoms and they're very hard to diagnose because of these vastly different expression of, of um, symptoms from the disorder. So it's very hard to diagnose. 
but it's really, really it's scientifically really interesting. Okay, so that's it for lecture notes. We have, we still have 30 minutes, right? Okay, so what I wanna do is I first want you to be able to answer number five on those review questions. And then I'm gonna give you one little activity for us to do. And Madison, I'm going to show you where it is on Moodle, what we're going to do. If I could get there. Okay, so if you go in supplemental material, the discussion question, we're going to do number five. So right here. And if you want to add more detail to what you answered for number four, now that you know how things work, you could do that. That wouldn't be bad. And then, where's my supplemental share as well? Here. We're going to do the inhibition of complex two. I don't think we're going to have time for the other one that I had, but we're going to do inhibition of complex two. Okay, and that's what I'm going to give you right now. So, Madison, if you have any questions, type them in the chat and I'll, I'll come back and check it. So, number five, and then we have this. Then we'll be done with the Australian We're only going to spend one day on so I'm only going to have questions that specifically target four and five. But if you don't remember the stuff from the beginning, you have to get the answer. So you know what I mean? Like the questions will be centered around four and five, but you still have to have the content knowledge from one, two, and three to answer. Yeah. What's that? For which for what? For five. Uncoupler. That should be uncoupler. Number five should be why do electron uncouplers? Sorry. My bad. Uncouplers. So where was that? Here. This one. I don't know if I can write on it. Electron uncouplers. Yeah, you can move your chairs, you can do whatever. I just want to meet back about five minutes so that we can get answers and that kind of thing. No, like a five or five, five to seven minutes to go over answers. Let in class go over answers. Okay, so I'm going to pause the recording and Madison. 